Ouch. Ooh, now six. I got a chance to go to Barcelona and cord around. And we're going to go play called Montserrat. So we'll get to, I want to show you some of this from the trip so you can see about Montserrat. You know where Barcelona is, right? It's in the east, east southeast of Spain. You got the ocean right there. See this beautiful Barcelona, and you can see the old picture here. That's the the basilica does not look like that anymore. Okay. The Muslim song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Barcelona in Catalan. I'm not sure if I say it right. Barcelona. It's a city on the coast. It is the capital of the largest city in the autonomous community of Catalonia, the second most po populous municipality in Spain, and with a population of 1.6 million within city limits. Its urban area extends to numerous neighboring municipalities within the province of Barcelona. It's home to about 4.8 million people making it the fifth and most populous urban area in the European Union, after Paris, the rural area, Madrid, and Milan. I never expected Barcelona to be this. Uh, the part of Barcelona is very planned. And I will show you some stuff about that someday. But it's, they planned the half of Barcelona, if you can see the old section, it's just kind of like, I call it piggly wiggly, let's just see what happens. The other half, all the all the buildings are put around the block. The blocks are the corners are cut so that when you walk into a into a, a four corners, it's completely wide open. So it feels a lot a lot more area wide open. And the center of the area is where you have basketball courts, tennis courts, whatever they have all the stuff in the middle, so that everybody from the building can have a place to. The origin of the settlement of the present day Barcelona is unclear. The ruins of an early settlement have been found, including different tombs and dwellings dating to before 5000 BC. That's a big deal. Founding of Barcelona is, there's two different legends about it. The first one, attributes the founding to Hercules. <laughs> Sorry, I can only think of Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> and got the joke to you. The second legend attributes the foundation directly to a historical Carthaginian general, Hamilcar Barca, father of Hannibal, who supposedly named the city Barcino after his family in the third century but still there's no historical evidence for any of this. There are a lot of different ruins in the Roman ruins, and then there's one, there's an office building that when you go in, instead of having a, an area for you to sit down or whatever, they have old pillars from an old te Roman temple that was discovered when they were building it, so they just left some piece of ruins there. It's such an interesting, such a shock when you walk in. Uh, there's a lot of artists in Barcelona, and some of my favorites, I have to say them. Juan Miró, who, Juan Miró, well known, he, is, he was an architect and a painter. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I just like his stuff. It makes no sense to me, but I really like his stuff. He was, his name was Juan Miró y Ferra. He was Catalan, a Spanish painter, sculptor, and ceramicist, born in Barcelona. There is a museum dedicated to him in Barcelona, and then another one in his adopted city of Mallorca. The other one that I like is Gaudí. What do you do? Oh. He's well known for his architecture. It's all over Barcelona. There's a lot of Gaudí everywhere. And of course, he's, the big thing is 
the masterpiece, the Basilica of Sagrada, La Sagrada Familia. I've done a presentation on this. If you want me to do it, do it again, I'll do it because I've updated it with new pictures. They have added a few new things. <laughs> Well, you can, they're hoping to finish everything by 2026. What they don't have on here is that you have the Apostle Towers, you have the four Gospel writers. The Mary Tower went up already, which is taller than theirs. And they're, they're working on the Jesus Tower, which is going to be even taller than all of them. It's going to be the tallest structure in Barcelona. And you'll be able to walk all the way up to the top to look at Barcelona. So I'll, we'll talk about that another day. Right now, we're going to go to Montserrat. And the Abbey of Montserrat, the Monastery de Saint Benet, it's in the mountains of Montserrat. The, they're to the northwest of Barcelona. To Barcelona. Montserrat. Montserrat means a jagged, serrated mountain. And it's, it's from the Latin Monserratus. The story is that angels came and started cutting the rocks and the stones <laughs> so that you guys, the mountains there. Because they're, they're mostly rock. So there's, there's very little dirt. It's mostly rock. You can get there by train, and or you can get there by bus or car, or you can get there by train, and then you truck, you ride the Teleférico. Um, we were blessed not to try it. <laughs> um, I, I've written a teleferico in Colorado between two, I don't know what to tell you, but what's that bridge, the tallest, the tallest hanging bridge? The Royal Gorge. The Royal Gorge. First of all, the Royal Gorge sways. Yeah. No. <laughs> and then we wrote the teleferico and it swayed also. <laughs> I was like, I came to Colorado to die. <laughs> so anyway, we have to, there's a teleferic on there. And you have to see, that's, that's the mountains. That's what I mean by jagged. It looks like it, it can be cut. There's so many chisels around on all this. The most of the, the Benedictine month, Monastery of Santa Maria de Montserrat. It's about 45 kilometers northwest of Barcelona. Let's say it's between 27 and 28 miles from Barcelona. So it's not a good, it's a day trip. It's called Santa Maria de Montserrat. It's an abbey of the Order of Saint Benedict, located on the mountain of Montserrat in, in Monistrol de Montserrat, Catalonia, Spain. It is notable for the Vir La Virgen de Montserrat. The monastery was founded in the 11th century and rebuilt in the 19th and the 20th century. And there's always around 80 monks there. I did hear that when, I did read that, I think I may go to, if I get to it, I'll skip it, but I'll say it now. In eight, they had to, it was destroyed twice. In, 18, in 1811 and 1812, when Napoleon came to conquer Spain, his troops destroyed the abbey, and then they were rebuilding, and then they were going to be destroyed again. Like I said, they have around 80 monks who live, according to the rule of St. Benedict. It is the most important religious retreat, and groups of young people from Barcelona and all over Catalonia make overnight hikes, at least once in their lives, to watch the sunrise from the from The legend says, says that the finding of the statue of the Virgin, Virgin of Montserrat around 880, it began a cult of the Morenita. Do you know what Morenita is? Dark skin. And you'll see the picture. Well, you saw the video. But she's dark. It materialized, you know, in the ninth century. However, the origin of the monastery is uncertain. It is known that around 1011, a monk from the monastery of Santa Maria came to the mountain to take charge 
of the Monasterio Santa Cecilia, thus leaving the monastery under the orders of the abbot Oliva de Ripoli. And there it is, in 1811, 1812, during that Polish invasion of Spain, the abbey was twice burned down and sacked. And many of the churches <coughs> were lost. In 1835, they closed until 1840, 1844. In 1880, Montserrat celebrated 1,000 years of existence. I cannot imagine a building a thousand, you know, they've been around for 1,000 years. Or they have a pretty plan. In September 1881, Coincide with the Catalan National Day, Pope Leo the Thirteenth proclaimed the Virgin of Montserrat the patron of Catalonia. And you can find her in here. It's hard to see, but she's on the altar. Sometimes when you're there, you can actually see it. The church is a single nave. It's supported by central columns carved in wood, representing the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. At the head of the main altar, decorated with enamels. Depicting very, there's, they, they have to, they depict various biblical scenes such as the Last Supper, the weddings of Cana, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. In the fifth century, there's a fifth fifth century cross <coughs> on the altar, which is the work of Lorenzo Ghiberti. On the altar, there's a shrine of octagonal form, and in the chancel, I come to find out, did you know what the, the chancel is? The dome you look in it's called the chancel. What does it mean? It's called the dome. In the chancel, there are various paintings by Alexander Ricoeur, well, like, like different uh, other painters. You can see one of the prophets right there. That's what it looks like. It's a gorgeous building. Just above the main altar is located the Room of the Virgin. You can access it crossing the portal of Alabaster, in which are presented various biblical scenes. You have all these paintings and details on the way there, like this one the, with the birth of Jesus. And that's a nativity scene. You have the Pentecost. In the days of Pentecost, you have different portions, different artists on there. The Sala de Cambria is a circular chapel with three apses. It was built between 1876 and 1884 by Villar e Carmona with the collaboration of his assistant, a young Antonio Gaudí. He got it started there. The vault is decorated by Juan Limona, and the figures of the angels and the sculptures of St. George are the, the material that you see here. You have, the other, you have the angels and the music on here. On that dome, you have the doors with different apostles and different people. You have the windows that Other set of doors, and then you meet La Morenita, and you get to see her face to face. There is a plastic cover right here, and I don't know if you can see there's a line right here. She's protected, but the, with the, the orb that she's holding is halfway out. So, what you're supposed to do is you go up, you take those steps, you go up, you put your hand on the orb, and you say a prayer right there. Pretty much everybody that was in my group did it. Whether they were Catholic or not, they just did it. So it's pretty cool. And it's, what I like about it is that it's not one of those where you go, oh, there's here somebody you can, yeah, you can see her. No, you can actually go up and see her face. It's like you're facing her. And you're looking at her and say, hi, this is what I need. Can you help? Yeah, that, that was, that was a, to me, that was really incredible. So they teach a Virgen de Montserrat. 
and she the the image is one of the black madonnas of Europe. Hence the familiar Catalan name La Moreneta, the little dark skin one or the little dark one. Believed by some people that it was carved in Jerusalem in the early days of the church. It's more likely a Romanist sculpture of wood from the 12th century. They the theory is that either the candle smoke or the wood or the varnish started getting darker or made the wood more darker, and so she became more than eight. But either way, she's beautiful. This is, the, I found this one online, so you can see how, how it all looks, but this is what it looks like when you go see her. You have to go up the steps, and you're, the altar is right, you know, the, the church is right behind her. All the way out, you can see the tiles, the, the, the you can see the decoration of one of them. Uh, the one on the left, <coughs> maybe myself, I know it's a little magnetic. So that is what we're taking in the Virgin Mary. The one on the right is about, the, 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 word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And by the way, in case you're not, the word in Latin for, the word in Latin for word is verb. And I found that Mind blowing that in Spanish we don't say la palabra se hizo carne, we say el verbo se hizo carne. We kept the word, the, we, we kept it as not a word, we kept it as a verb. It changes my whole theology of Catholicism. And that's just me. And it, it, el, el verbo es va a ser hombre, he became man, habita entre nosotros. Habits, any habits with her or lives with us. Um, as you know, if you live in the Catholic or not, to, if you go to any church, you're going to have the candles. What I love about these is look at all the colors. It was so cool to walk out of you and you have a whole wall. I mean, I'm talking a whole, whole wall. It was probably about bigger than longer than this. All with different sections with all the different color candles, and you can buy your color candle and go get it in there. It's cool. So you have one more candle. I love these. These are the old ones. But you have a, you, going in and coming out, you have different, all kinds of different things in there. This is something very European. Every city in Spain that I have been to, there are places for you to drink water. Little fountains or little spigots, and you can go and get your water and move on. With autumn, potable, autumn, water, whatever. Um, you don't pay anything, you don't have to worry about anything. All over the place. If you're thirsty, you find it. So they, okay. <coughs> I found the one for here. You have the the facade is completely covered with different things. Part of it is this one is Jesus and twelve apostles. And you can, if you have time, you can figure out which apostle is which. Because here's Jesus. That's easy to find. He's always in the middle. Peter, I can tell you Peter because he's got the keys and the upside down cross. And you know that's the story of how Jesus, I mean, how Peter was martyred. He didn't, he didn't see it. He didn't think he was he was deemed good enough to be crucified the same way, so he had to be turned, turned upside down. And all the other apostles are on there. I don't know all the different means. There's different symbols and things behind them. That's what I was saying. And it's not the big one. I know that they were, they were St. Paul. If St. Paul would be on there. It would, he would be there with a big sword because he was. Um, one of the other ones, are, I don't know the, the, all the other ones. St. John is probably the one that looks the oldest because he didn't get martyred. He's the only one. All the other. So you have. This is something I like about statues and stuff. You have to figure out all the, all the different meanings, all the different things behind them so you understand who they're talking about or who that person is. Yeah, Paul he, wouldn't be. He it. was not one. No, of Paul wouldn't be because he's not. He was one of the twelve. Yeah, but and Judas. I know Judas is not there. Yeah. So 
So, yes. so whoever yes. took over for, for Judas, Matthias. Matthias, he would probably be there. So I'll get, see, see, this one, he's kind of tight. I, I don't know. I wish I knew this. Daniel, yeah. I Someone wish I knew this. Like a or, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I wish I knew all of them. I'm, I'm going to have to dig up a little more on them and know what, what the different things are. I know this. This was another one of how he died. It's a okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, oh my God, I think we're gonna like that. <laughs> that was easy. And what is Peter usually at? Peter is usually to his right or or nearby, and Peter always has the keys. And so they can all drive home. So it's pretty simple. <laughs> and then outside, uh, you have statues of things. You have on the left. My man, my man back to him, <laughs> standing next to some Loyola. And over here, this is so cool. It's Joseph with Jesus. And I like it because it's a young Joseph. Sorry, I think I'm a young Joseph. I don't, the old man is not here anymore. So. But you have, a, you have that up there. You also have somebody's tomb. The, this is the sepulcher of Don Juan de Aragon. He's the prince of the royal house of Catalonia. He's nephew of Ferdinand the Catholic. He is Conde, Conde? Count? Count? Yeah. Count of Ribagorza, the first Duke of the Moon, <laughs> Sir of the <laughs> 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 It's one of those, oh, he's dead, let's just get him on the title. Uh, <laughs> sir of the Amposta Virrey, uh, Vice King of Catalonia and Napoles, he died on the 5th of July of 1528. That's his tomb. It's out there in the world. They were digging in this incredible tomb of Joseph. You also have. You know, this is dedicated to the, the different. You can tell by the hats. Art, the, the cardinals, bishops, archbishops, they're all they're all there. So then you have all this art to talk about. Like this is about Compostela. Compostela, by the way, is is Campo Estrella. Compostela, feel the stars. And you have the, that's the Church of Santiago on the Compostela. And so you have that. So you have the different ethnicities up here. You have German, Galician, French, Hispanic. You talk about spirituality here. You talk about reconstruction. reconstruction. <coughs> you know, I saw this and I thought of one thing: all roads lead to Rome. And they do. Via Tiburtina, via, <laughs> you have the Via the Way, and you have this symbol in the middle for Rome. Oh, Romeo, Venus, Wolf. Yeah? You with me? Oh. I haven't lost you. You're not bored out of your mind here. Okay, can you tell me what this is? Males, yes, it's a it's a mailbox. <laughs> it's out there. You can walk around and see it. This is all the stuff you find on the walls. This is a mailbox. I like this. I thought it was, I was a little weary of putting anything in there. Correos y telégrafos. This is one of the things that they. Almost everybody has done, has done it. You have the multi, it, it's an optical illusion. It's all an optical illusion. This is coming towards you, right? Mm -hmm. This part, C, the squares in the middle. She starts going, looking towards you. This is, this is what it looks like if you see it. It's like it's chiseled in. But when you see it, it looks like it's out. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's, it's all going in as opposed to coming. I, 
but it's an optical illusion that makes you think that somebody, because you can actually touch it, but you can't get your hand goes in. It's the same thing. They all started doing it over there, and it's all over the place. And some of them are really cool, like this one. I could, I was like, oh my goodness. I showed it to my students, and they were like, wait, wow. They were like, yes. At 8 in the morning, is really fun to mess with your mind. <laughs> and then there's this one which, did, which didn't work. It just doesn't go there. Oh, okay. No. But it's the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a style that apparently a lot of the artists are using, that whole optical illusion thing. Um, I don't know. And if you like heights, outside you can get the fornicular, which you can write to a higher level than where you're at. Uh, the fornicular doesn't, it looks like it's like flat against it, but it, it's actually, it actually, inside it's actually straightened up, so you don't, you're not leaning out, you're, you can stand up straight. But see, there's, there's the Abbey, and those even higher, higher up now. When you walk around, what some of the things you discover is that they have lots of art from different people you have no idea who they are. But it's really fun to see it, and it's cool that you're going up. You'll go up some steps, and there's there's one thing. You go down some steps, there's something else over there. And this is a picture of the statue, and I found this fact. This, I, this guy, I was like, okay, why are you putting that over there? And then you realize. Pablo Casals was a famous cellist. He, I know, I heard of him because if I was down in Costa Rica, well, he was down. And Pablo Casals was, it was a big deal in Costa Rica. <coughs> he didn't know he was Spanish. Mm -hmm. He had like a girl in Puerto Rico, so I thought, oh, it's because he was Puerto Rican. And I thought, why are you giving a Puerto Rican a place? Mm -hmm. But he's, because he's, he's, he's from Spain. And, and this I found, again, you walk up and down, you get tired. You're know, walking up and down, there's all the different levels compared to. There's a beautiful statue of him. 1876 to 1976. Mm -hmm. Really a good life. He's regarded as a preeminent cellist for the first half of the 20th century. And one of the greatest cellists of all time. Now I'm going to show you something. We were, one of the things we did, we walked and we found this. Looks like an abandoned building. It looks kind of like a I don't know. It was all closed up, so you couldn't get in, but there was a little hole that you could look inside it. And inside is a room. Yeah, I would, this, was a, well, this was a group from my old school in Oslo. We were, so the year I, I left Oslo, we, my friend needed somebody else to go with us, so I went with him. So I was hanging out with the boys, and then we, we went snooping around, and we found this. It could be a tomb, it could be a little altar, it could be a little chapel. All I know is it's, it's beautiful, but you have that sad, the, the, the idea that, like, okay, okay, this is probably a tomb, is because you have Mary and she's sad. So I'm thinking it, it must be somebody buried here. But I have no proof of anything. Building was locked, and he said was little. He was like a little hut. And there were no windows, no little thing. You peek in, and there it is. Maybe you weren't supposed to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and you find other stuff like that. I wish I would have gone there. I wouldn't want to know what that is. There's all kinds of crazy things. 